everyone. We're just going to give it about 20 seconds just to let everyone connect. And welcome back to anyone that just joined us in the previous session where we looked at the changes to the policies. This is a two hour TCF marathon this afternoon. Um, but we will not be sprinting through this. We've got plenty of time to take lots of questions at the end. So I think with that, we're one minute past. I think we've already, we're into the hundreds of, of people on here. So let's kick off. So um, good afternoon and welcome to IB Europe's dedicated webinar to the Transparency and Consent Framework, also known as the TCF. My name is Helen Mozard. I'm the CMO of Europe. Uh, and today we'll be sharing an overview of the changes to the TCF technical specifications between version 2.1 and version 2.2. So we will have a presentation that should last, I'm looking at Neil on around maybe 25 minutes, and then we will have a queue and a session. And because we're live today, we would encourage you to post any questions you have into the Q&A box at the bottom. We're going to be taking um, a note of all of the questions. We'll try and get through as many as we possibly can, but if not, we'll be incorporating those into our FAQs. And to also let um, everyone know that in the next couple of weeks, we will be organizing uh, a series of webinars for the three different stakeholder groups, vendors, CMPs, and publishers where we can do more of a deep dive into these technical changes and also the policy changes so you can ask um, some more tailored questions there. Um, so without that, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, uh, Ninon Wagner, who is our Privacy Director at IB Europe, and she will introduce our speakers and run through the agenda with you. Thanks so much. Over to you, Ninon. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, or hello again, if you were on the webinar just before. Uh, so today, uh, for the webinar about the changes to the technical specification, we have a, a, a number of uh, speakers. We have uh, Heinz Bowman, who is a product and engineering consultant and is uh, supporting IAB Rock with the uh, changes to the uh, technical specification. We have Julien Delomo, uh, staff system architect at Microsoft, uh, who is also the chair uh, of the TCF Framework Signal Working Group. So the working group that looks after uh, anything relating to the uh, technical uh, part of the TCF. Uh, we have uh, uh, as well uh, Rowena Lam, uh, Senior Director of Product uh, Privacy and Data at IAB Tech Lab. And IAB Tech Lab is our uh, partner uh, to build uh, and evolve the uh, TCF. Uh, and so right now uh, from the 2.1 uh, to the 2.2. Um, so this uh, webinar is a follow-up of uh, uh, the webinar that described just before the main changes to the uh, policy. Uh, and we are now going to uh, look at uh, the corresponding changes to the technical specification. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, so I can just give quickly the, the agenda. Uh, so first, uh, Gina is going to give a, a, an overview of the timeline. So when uh, TCRV 2.2 is going to be released and the timing for uh, participants to make the changes. Uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, Rowena on the call will be able to provide some explanation about the minor changes to the CMP API commands. Uh, then uh, all of them will be able to describe the uh, um, upcoming changes to the uh, global vendor list. Uh, we explained it before, our vendors will be required to uh, provide additional information that will be included in the GVL, which means that we will have a new version of the GVL. Uh, finally, uh, we'll go over the removal of legitimate interest for purposes three to six. Uh, and last point on the agenda, a quick reminder about the revocation of consensus.org uh, subdomain delegation to CMPs. And we will have uh, lots of time for uh, Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Julien to go over the uh, timeline for everyone. Thank you, Nino. Um, so we've just entered uh, a couple of days ago the uh, uh, consultation period uh, where we published the first draft of the specification. Uh, on May 12, this period will finish, and May 15, we will release the official specification for the TCF version 2.2. Um, the vendors will then be uh, given the ability to register uh, additional information that are required under TCF 2.2. Uh, 
such as we, we see them in detail after, but the uh, type of data that they uh, process, of personal data that they process, um, the retention period for the different purposes for which they apply. Uh, and so vendors will need to provide this information to the, um, in their TCF registration before June 30. Uh, and then the industry will have until September 30, so end of the September months, to uh, adapt fully the version 2.2 and deprecate the version 2.1. So no, no uh, new TC string could be created on version 2.1 uh, past September 30. Uh, overall, that gives the industry four and a half months to implement the changes between the version 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, again, we we'll see them in detail what the changes uh, involve, but uh, from a technical specification, most of the work will be done by CMP, uh, as most of the changes will be their policies uh, with things that need to be displayed by the CMP in the UI or GVL, additional information that vendors will provide that CMP, which are the main uh, this main user of the GVL, will need to ingest. The TC string format itself is not changing. Uh, so vendors that digest the TC string will be able to use uh, for the very most part the same code that they're using today for the decoding the TC string. Uh, and there will be, uh, let's say, a small amount of work for publishers, specifically with regard to um, reducing their, um, their list of vendors. Uh, but we, we see all of those in details uh, after doing this webinar. Rowena, maybe if you want to add uh, a few words on the uh, uh, consultation period. Yes. So as you mentioned, Julian, um, it, we are open for public comment at this time. It is PR 334 on um, GitHub, where you can view all of the changes that will be discussed today. Um, and for anyone who would like to submit any feedback during this um, consultation period, which ends on May 12th, you can do that by sending an email to transparencyframework at techlab.com. Next slide. Uh, so we'll dive into the main changes. And the first thing is the changes to the TCF API commands. This is the one and only update to the TCF um, CMP API. So the get TC data command is being deprecated as of TCF version 2.2 in this latest version. Um, and the reason for this is that the Belgian BPA said in its decision that vendors were not automatically notified when the users update their choices, um, like when they're withdrawing consent as an example. So now vendors uh, are going to need to, they must register an event listener to get the most up-to-date TC strings on web. And then on mobile, vendors must listen to IAB TCF keys to um, update to get the TC string. Next slide. So the next section, we are going to talk about the additional information that we are making available to the global vendor list. There's a, quite a few changes. Uh, we heard already data retention. Uh, we have a new data categories, a complete new section we're adding. Uh, all the purposes, text and, and strings are changing. Uh, the uh, policy URL is going to be updated and expanded, uh, an additional URL and support for multiple languages and a few other things. And because of all these changes, the actual specification uh, version is going from two to version three. And so you will find that once we posted this under the new URL, which is v3 vendor list JSON, and everything else with the archives is that follows the same rule that we had before. The existing uh, version two global vendor list will remain available during the impl implementation period. So. Uh, we'll be backwards compatible until uh, the end of September. But we will not update this after the June date. Uh, so June, sometime in the end of June is the last time we're updating version uh, two, and then it just remains on that last version that we have. Um, a couple of questions that already came up during the review period about this uh, that we put out here. 
uh, how to know which global vendor version we use when reading the TC string. So it's a little bit tricky because the version, the TC, uh, the global vendor list version is not in the actual TC string, but the policy version is there. And the policy version will be updated to version four. So that's in the string. So if you see the policy version version four, that means you need to uh, use the global vendor list uh, version three. That's kind of during the um, uh, transition period where you can have both of these available uh, that you can figure out which one to actually use. And another question that came up was around regarding the Canadian uh, global vendor list. So that's completely separate from our European one. And it's going to remain where it is today on the, the V2 going forward. And the think next slide is, I believe, Julian. Yes, thank you. Um, so one of the modifications that we've done uh, on the GVL global <laughs> vendor list will be for the purposes, special purposes, features, and special features object. Uh, those objects, as you can see on the screen right now, are defined by an ID a name, a description, and they used to be defined as well by a description legal, which was a more uh, uh, legal uh, verbatim definition, description of the purposes. Uh, however, part of the DPS ruling was that those uh, legal texts were considered too complicated, and they were making it hard for users to understand the purposes that we were pursuing with TCF. Therefore, we've decided to replace them by uh, improved re redefining the description, so the user-friendly description uh, field, as well as uh, complementing them with illustration, example of how purposes can be used, uh, real use cases of how those purposes are being pursued by vendors. Um, the hope is that those should be uh, given more transparency to users about how their data is being used by vendors. Moving on to the next slide, um, I think Rowena. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I covered that one. Uh, so the next thing is the taxonomy of the ca categories of data. Uh, I mentioned this earlier. It's a new section, a new thing that comes in that needs to be uh, declared. And this is for vendors to declare the, the categories of data that they are collecting and processing for each purpose um, that they actually are declaring. And this is done in line with the data protection authorities' expectations so the user actually know what kind of um, data is collected. And uh, this is uh, declared by the vendor and the CMPs uh, will need to disclose this uh, through the UI. And the next slide, we just think back to Julian. Thanks. So data retention. Uh, part of the requirement uh, from the wording was to provide uh, further transparency with regard to <coughs> data retention for purposes. Um, so we've added a new field within the uh, global vendor list. Uh, part of the vendor registration, vendors will need to indicate for each purposes for which they uh, they registered, uh, for how long will they retain the data, personal data uh, from users? So in the example above, we have a vendor uh, which apply for purposes one, two, three, and nine. So this vendor must disclose uh, the data retention for the purposes two, three, and nine, purpose one being cookie related and having his own uh, existing uh, retention information. Um, but for purpose two, three, and nine, the vendor will need to provide information about how, for how long does he retain the user's personal data. This will be made with the addi uh, added data retention feed in the GVL. So uh, during the registration, vendors will indicate for how long they do. So in, in our example here, the vendor disclosed that for purposes two and three, he was using a 30 days retention period. And for purpose nine, he was using a 180 days uh, retention. This will translate in the GVL as data retention field that you see here with what we call a standard retention of 30 days, which is a most common 
retention among the different purposes that the vendors applied for. And then for each purposes and special purposes, the vendor will be able to uh, override the standard retention to the actual retention is using for this purpose. The idea with the standard retention and override uh, per purpose and special purposes was just to uh, limit the size, the impact on the size of the GVL as much as, as, as much as possible. Vendors will need to disclose for each purposes the exact retention, and then the TCF will automatically compute what the standard retention value is and what each purpose override, special purpose override is. Retention will be set in days, and for any <coughs> shorter than a day retention. So, so for example, session retention or on the fly retention, uh, those will be indicated by a value of zero. This information will be digested by CMPs and will be disclosed to the end users enhancing the transparency uh, in line with data protection authority's expectation. And moving on to the next slide, I think where are we now? Yep. Thanks, Julian. Um, so there's a couple of things here. Um, so we have something new here called URLs, which is an array of objects. This array allows for vendors to declare multiple URLs for their privacy policies, um, an explanation of their legitimate interests at stake for, for multiple languages. So in the current version of the GVL, there's just one URL where privacy policies are listed. Um, and it's under that uh, policy URL. Um, and under that, you were only able to include a single link. And so that's what's changed here. And note that um, now it's not policy URL, but it's listed as privacy. Um, and there's another URL field here that is new called a uh, legitimate interest claim. And this new key was added to support um, the policy requirement that if you were in the last uh, webinar, you may have heard about. Um, so the reason for these updates and this change is that there were several DPAs that have indicated that privacy related information should be made available to the users in their language. So now this now there is the option for vendors to include multiple links to um, the privacy policies. Next slide. So uh, another change that we made to the uh, TCF is we removed the ability for vendors to disclose purposes three to six under legitimate interest basis. Uh, so purpose three to six are purposes related to um, profile. So creating ad profile, selecting personalized ad, creating personalized content profile and selecting personalized content. Uh, those purposes, which are usually um, the ones that can be perceived by users as the most uh, invasive and in which the um, a DPA uh, was um, less comfortable with vendors relying on legitimate interest. Uh, led us to decide and remove the ability for vendors to disclose those uh, purposes under legitimate interest, meaning that they could only do so on the basis of consent. Uh, the very large majority of vendors were already um, applying for those purposes under consent, so this should only impact a very small minority of vendors, which will remain free to um, perform those purposes under legitimate interest outside of the TCF. But within TCF, again, to avoid um, creating um, uh, friction uh, for a, a small minority, we prefer to remove the ability to do legitimate interest for those purposes. Um, it means that uh, in TC string created under the version 2.2, all of the uh, legitimate interest bits for purposes 3 to 6 will have to be set to 0 meaning there, there is no legitimate interest possible under those purposes. Um, this does not apply to the publisher TC string segment. So 
publishers that use the publisher TC string segment for their own purposes would still be still have freedom to um, uh, to work based on legitimate interest. And moving on to the next slide, uh, Heinz, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the last part is just a reminder that's already out and all the CMPs and everybody has been uh, um, informed that on July 10th, we're going to uh, revoke the ability to delegate uh, subdomains uh, through consensus.org. And it's just a reminder that this is going to happen on that scheduled date. And so if you are still using this, I know at least one CMP who does that, uh, you will need to actually change, otherwise your CMP will be broken on June, July 10th. Sorry, it's July 10th when this happens. So, uh, you know, it says in bold, CMPs are not required to their surface the UI to uh, accommodate this update. So, uh, but you need to actually change your in the, uh, implementation. So you're not loading from consensus.org. And I think this is the last kind of slide with me to think there's another one to wrap this up, please. Next slide. Uh, so how uh, participants can anticipate uh, TCFE uh, version 2.2. So CMPs, uh, obviously you need to uh, ingest, read and, and use the new global vendor list. Um, build a new user facing disclosure for the CMP UIs. I think there's a couple additional things that the spec, uh, the, the policy is requiring uh, that we haven't covered here, which are not kind of uh, uh, API or, or global vendors updates, but I believe there's also a place that the CMPs need to disclose uh, the total vendors used in the UI somewhere. And then for vendors, uh, make sure that the live installation use event listeners. If you use macros, you can continue using the macros, uh, but we encourage everybody if all possible to actually use the event listener and, the, uh, and the, from the JavaScript. And then review and update the TCF registration. Uh, so that's something all vendors have to do when you come in. Uh, once we launch the updated uh, uh, vendor registration, you will find that several of the new items and you have to fill them out. And as you do this, I also encourage you to go ahead and review your uh, MUX uh, cookie age setting because that's one of the things we see mostly being wrong uh so if you can then review this and update as necessary but you will and you need to updates to all the other things we just talked about and the next steps here uh, there's webinars uh, for each category uh, of stakeholders so there's one for vendors cmps and publishers uh, and i believe the recording of all the webinars will be available on the ib european website and this brings us to q and a i don't know who is facilitating but i hand back to our facilitator. Yeah, yeah I can uh, <laughs> I can facilitate the Q and A. Um, yeah, we have a, a couple. Uh, the first one, um, not sure who wants to take this one, but maybe you, Ains. Um, when disclosing the data uh, declaration and data retention in the CMP UI, be updated automatically via our CMP vendor, or is it present in the uh, IAB vendor list in the UI? Um, so maybe uh, rather a need for clarification about the uh, mechanism between the GVN and uh, how CMP draw information yes. from that. I'm uh, happy to, to take this one, you know. So okay. uh, the, the GVL is a, a public JSON file that contains all the information about the vendor's registration. So vendors will go to the IB Europe um, TCF website. They will register, meaning that they will indicate which purposes they perform under which legal base, uh, for how long do they retain the data, everything that we've just discussed. And then the, the managing organization will generate a JSON file reflecting all of those information. This file is public and will be digested mostly, mainly by CMP. So CMP will get that information. Uh, they will then, through their CMP product, allow the publishers that they work with or advertisers that they work with, to, for example, select down the list of vendors that the publisher, advertiser work with. Uh, they will be able, publishers will be able to restrict, for example, certain purposes or apply some publisher restriction uh, as we call them in TCF to limit the ability to use certain legal base for certain 
purposes. Once they've done that in the CMP backend UI, the CMP will then generate as a CMP UI that will be prompted to users on the publisher's website. And the CMP will get all of those information, the data retention, uh, data declaration, directly from the GVL, from the information registered by the vendors. And the CMP will be in charge of delivering that information back to the end user, not the publisher. The publisher role is really just to work with the CMP to configure the CMP UI as he see fits within the um, uh, policies uh, enforced by the TCM. Yeah, thank you, uh, Julien. Uh, we have a, a question that uh, might be also <coughs> relating to the uh, policy. Uh, so maybe I will start answering that uh, before handing over. Uh, but uh, uh, someone is saying that they may have different uh, retention periods uh, for different data categories collected against any given purpose. Uh, so bundling the retention period against the purpose uh, may confuse an end user. Uh, do we need to default to the maximum age in days? Uh, so it actually was a, a discussion that we had uh, when we uh, thought about adding uh, the data retention uh, within the, the TCF. Should we do it on a per purpose basis or on a per category of data uh, basis? Uh, the conclusion that uh, was that uh, we should do it on a per purpose basis, also in line with the GDPR requirement uh, that say that you should keep uh, data uh, for the amount of time necessary to achieve uh, the purpose uh, that you are pursuing. So it's actually natural for vendors to have. A differentiated uh, retention period depending on the purpose uh, they are uh, achieving, uh, which is why we defaulted to uh, per purpose basis rather than category of data uh, basis. Uh, so if you have uh, at this point in time uh, a different practice, uh, yes, you will be able to default to the uh, maximum age in days of the uh, of the category of data that you keep the, the longest uh, for for these purposes. Um, but that was the reasoning, and I'm not sure if someone else uh, wants to uh, jump on this question. Um, if not, uh, there is a question about uh, which uh, data protection authority have indicated the need to have privacy policies in the long local language. So as usual, not all of them. It's always a bit different per market, um, but we earned uh, feedback uh, in particular from the uh, Czech market. So the uh, UOU, uh, the Data <coughs> Protection Authority in Czech Republic, uh, that seems to require uh, that, uh, especially from publisher, uh, also a feedback from the uh, ICO uh, in the UK. Uh, and apparently uh, some uh, German DPAs are also uh, looking into that uh, right now, uh, which is why we have decided to provide support uh, for uh, multiple language within the TCF. And Peter, you raised your hand. Yeah, yes, perhaps just to add, this is, this is something that we're noticing uh, in other jurisdictions as well. So for instance, in Belgium, uh, there was a, there have been a couple of decisions saying that it really has to be in the language, the information you're providing in a privacy notice or whatever, it has to be in the language in which you communicate with data subjects. And so it's all about consistency. So if your website is available in five languages, then you should have your privacy statement in five languages. And so that is the kind of information you should be including in five languages than in the GVL registration. Uh, we've seen something similar in where authorities that are consumer protection authorities have been using their same rules. It has to be understandable for the consumer and they're applying that in the data in data protection context. So if you think purely in terms of trying to see which are the jurisdictions where the, the authorities are saying that, the list might start small, but it gradually grows because consumer protection authorities are starting to use the same standards as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, a question probably for Ains, uh, I was looking into uh, 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 the publication of the new GVL. Will all the current vendor will be available in GVL v3 at start? Can you yeah, so we on? just discussed this yesterday in the uh, framework signaling group, and uh, we kind of decided that the new global vendor list version three will only be populated with the vendors that have updated the information 
Uh, it's mainly done so we actually can track this and there's an incentive for the vendors to actually go and update um, uh, the information and that we need for version three. So to answer, no, it will not be pre-populated with the ones that are in version two. Yeah, thank you. And so if you're a vendor, please make sure to update your registration before June 30, uh, and then you will be added to the new uh, DVL. Um, uh, we are, I'm sorry, just, just, maybe uh, to add on this, just to add on this one, I think also um, the message for publishers and CMPs would be that with regard to timeline and when to adopt the TCF 2.2 and start collecting 2.2 TC string, um, the recommendation would be to not start before June 30, which is a period that's given to vendors to register under version 2.2, but only start to do so after June 30, where vendors should in theory all have migrated over to TCF 2.2. Um, again, this will also incentivize vendors to update their registration to be compatible with version 2.2 before June 30. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a question about uh, uh, technical integration. I think uh, what is the expectation for uh, constant thing sharing uh, between SSP and DSP? Uh, for example, the publisher only has Xander as a valid vendor, uh, and the user grants consent to Xander as, as Xander passes that impression through the bitstream with the consent string. Is the expectation of downstream uh, DSP to process that impression as no consent? Uh, yeah, happy to, especially since Xander is named as the example. Uh, <laughs> we will make things even simpler for me. Uh, so with regard to constant string sharing, uh, the constant string should always be shared uh, from one vendor to another uh, when making an ad call, a bid request, or anything. Because uh, the constant string is basically just the um, reflection of the user choices. Uh, with regard to uh, the personal data that may be present in bid request, if a vendor that is initiating a bid request has established legal base consent for data processing and has access to personal data during his auction, and is making a bid request, so forwarding a request information to another vendor that from the TC string has not established legal base for processing personal data, then the uh, initiating vendor, Xander, in the uh, provided example, should not include any personal data when making the bid request to the uh, second vendor. Uh, the other vendor should decode the TC string, uh, be informed as such that the, users, the user made choices that uh, did not allow him to establish legal base and act accordingly. Likely, this means that they will not be able to process personal data. There will be no personal data anyway in the bid request they receive. But would they uh, decide to still bid on the impression, which they can do without processing personal data, and deliver a nod on the page? They should be. Um, they should likely not try to collect any personal data because, uh, again, unless the user has changes his choice in between the auction and the time they deliver on the page. Uh, this vendor likely has no legal base established to process personal data. Yeah, thank you, Julien. And at the uh, highest level, like in, in the policy, in any case, like a, a vendor that receives uh, personal data must only, always check that it has established a legal basis, and if not, uh, it should not retain uh, the, the personal data. Um, so irrespective of the yeah, integration, whether it's within the uh, open RTB or outside, um, a question probably for Rowena uh, about the uh, CMP API. Either change to uh, how CMPs need to provide access to the TCF API, uh, so underscore underscore TCF API, or does this fall under the change to switching to add event listener? Yeah, the only update here is that the get TC data command is um, being deprecated. So the expectation of um, is that vendors should be. Um, uh, setting event listeners moving forward. Uh, so from a CMP perspective, you're you're not changing how you're providing access. Thank you. 
Um, we have uh, another question, which is, uh, uh, but I don't think that we will be able to answer because it would be more about providing uh, legal guidance about uh, TCF implementation. So if a client would like to use app tags to capture impression data, uh, what kind of consent would they need? Uh, so it depends, uh, obviously, uh, on the purpose and whether you uh, read uh, or write information on the user device. So this is really an assessment that your company needs to make. Uh, so I don't think we can provide an answer of uh, what kind of consent uh, is needed in that, uh, uh, in that case. Um, is there any indication of non-compliance by vendors with the new uh, requirements of room setting? Uh, for example, cookie max, max age, uh, such as receiving emails or warning in the uh, consent form. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Ains, you want to take this one or if you want me to take this one, uh, given that it's about- Well, I can maybe start on, on some of it and then you can maybe talk about the compliance stuff that we do. Uh, so the form where you actually register has quite a few checks to make sure that the things that you need to fill in are filled in. It also does some checks that you cannot uh, uh, trip over some of the typical mistakes that we've seen in the past. Uh, so we added some additional dependencies between some of the fields that exist that, that um, will warn you if there is a, a problem. Uh, so you can fix this ahead of time. Then you know you register and then we find this during the compliance period. Uh, you mentioned there the uh, cookie max age. That's a little tricky because there we actually don't have a check with uh, looking into the um, uh, cookie declaration JSON file. And what we're finding is that, you know, and it's probably, you know, it's because I think the history is the cookie max age was added first. And then we added in later that, that declaration of all the different cookies. And now we can actually, you know, we, we're finding that the, the cookie max age is not the max age of the cookies that you actually declared. And that's why kind of be good, everybody looking at this. We don't check for this. Uh, that's something that you will need to do yourself. But we put a warning into the, 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 the registration of that fact that please double check that value. Uh, it's not like an error, but there's a warning. So kind of, so you can actually get a message there and telling you, hey, you should double check this. And then you can update to we can prevent these errors that we're seeing in the compliance. And maybe um, uh, Ninon can talk a little bit about what we do with the compliance. Um, yeah, so I can complete in terms of uh, compliance. What we do <coughs> is uh, 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 so we have a, a first part which consists in uh, uh, crawling the vendor's uh, device storage at JSON file uh, in, at the start. Huh? Uh, there was lots of issues and lots of vendors uh, enter the uh, enforcement process. Uh, I think that we are uh, down to around 30 vendors that still have a, a, a JSON file that uh, does not conform to the uh, technical specification. Uh, and we also do uh, calling of live installations, so vendor tags and script. Uh, so we uh, primarily focus on the fact that they uh, use cookie uh, that have a max duration that is uh, equal or below what they have declared in the GVL, uh, whether they set cookie without consent for purpose one, uh, whether they uh, manipulate the TC string uh, or uh, that they pass uh, the TC string as written by the CMP API. Uh, we are also verifying that they do not uh, send uh, personal data to vendor that have no legal basis for processing. Uh, so these checks are already being performed. We are going to increase the volume of auditing. Um, so uh, there will be um, yeah, higher expectation on the vendor side uh, when it comes to uh, compliance with the policy. And I think that we will do uh, dedicated communication about uh, the scope of this new uh, compliance program and the enforcement process. Um, a question uh, maybe for you, Romina, about the ID uh, allocation, now that we have a uh, multiple uh, framework. Uh, should we uh, expect to have uh, big vendor IDs like uh, uh, more than uh, 4,000 and uh, gaps uh, between vendors ID in the GVLV3. Yeah, uh, the question to the, or the answer, the question, the answer to this is that uh, yes, you will see a larger vendor IDs um, because there are multiple frameworks now and uh, we are deduping vendor IDs so that if you are participating um, within a TCF 
um, and you are also participating, participating, for example, in TCF Canada, you would have a single vendor ID. Um, and due to that deduplication, uh, there are one going to be potential gaps um, in the list. Um, and there will be vendor IDs that are larger than 4096 potentially as new vendors are added. Thank you, Rowena. Um, maybe a, a question uh, so from Andreas. Uh, what is the retention time to specialize their purpose if we use a session storage instead of a cookie? So I think uh, we tackled this uh, earlier when it's a session, what should be registered and how it is disclosed on the GBN. Uh, either uh, one, any of you, I think, can, can take this one. Yeah. Uh, so, so for retention uh, that are under a day, so anything from one millisecond to 23 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds, uh, the value should be zero, indicating a session uh, retention, uh, which again is not uh, a specific number of minutes, it's really a session. Uh, so anything between zero and a day, value is zero. Thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, a question about uh, whether there is technical information available describing uh, the level of uniqueness uh, between TC generating uh, strings. Uh, so I think this has been discussed already before. Uh, we have also made like, some uh, iteration, in fact, onto the TC string. Maybe you want to uh, take this one, Julia, about uh, uh, the level of entropy. Sure. Uh, so the level of entropy uh, or uniqueness of a TC string is really low. Um, we used to store timing information in the TC string down to millisecond, which at the time um, could have uh, made TC string more unique. We've changed that so that no timestamp are done to a day. And it's actually a breach of the policies to keep using millisecond timestamp within TC string. So when a user goes on a publisher's website and select either consent to everything or do not consent to everything, the generated TC string will be the exact same TC string as for any user that made the choice on that day. Uh, so again, the level of uniqueness here is non-existent. Yeah, thank you, uh, Julien. Uh, so less of a technical question. Uh, so yeah, so in, in, I, I think it's probably more of a policy question. Why is the requirement regarding legitimate interest signals not applied for the publisher uh, TC segment when the concern for abuse of the uh, legitimate interest signal for purposes three to six apply as much to the publisher as it does to the vendor? Uh, so the reason why, well, first, uh, the publisher TC segment is an optional segment in the TC string, which is not governed uh, by the TCF policy. Uh, it's a, a, a segment uh, that can be used by publisher to establish their own uh, legal basis for their own uh, purposes or uh, on behalf of vendors that do not uh, participate in the TCF. So this is not governed uh, by the policy, which is why we cannot uh, impose anything uh, in relation to its use. Uh, and uh, we uh, also gather that there may be some uh, use cases where publisher could uh, or won't rely on uh, legitimate interest, in particular uh, when it comes to uh, content personalization, uh, even if it's really uh, minimal. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the policy reason uh, to the question. Um, another question about the revocation of uh, EU consent dash v2 and consent street dot org uh, uh, on a different domain also need to be done by our uh, CMP vendor. Uh, so I think it's a two step uh, process, huh? uh, but uh, publisher need to do something. Maybe uh, someone here can uh, uh, either end or Julien or Rina take this one. Yeah, I can give a try on this. So since I work for a CMP that has that, uh, it is the CMP's responsibility to change this. And so, yes, you will need to, if you know that your CMP does that, you need to knock at their door and make sure they change this. Otherwise, your CMP is actually going to break. Yeah, 
when this is going to be uh, no longer allowed. That means, you know, in the case that I know, the CMP would actually no longer load. Uh, so your uh, once you have it cached, it works, but once it's not, then you will not be able to load it anymore because they load it from uh, consent to the door. So this is just the CMPs need to update this and then let the publishers know. And then though it depends then on the CMPs implementation and how it's implemented uh, on the publisher side, what did the publishers actually have to do to follow through. Thank you, Anne. Uh, a little question, but uh, is there a non-technical summary of the policy changes that we can find? So uh, we are going to publish, uh, there was a webinar just before about the policy changes, and we are also going to publish a set of uh, uh, materials so that everyone has an advance warning uh, of what's coming. So you will uh, find that uh, on our website. Um, will there be uh, any impact to Google's uh, additional uh, consent vendor list? Uh, or consent string, so the IC, uh, IC string. Uh, so I want to flag up some that it is not covered either by the uh, TCF policy, not governed by the TCF policy, but maybe Julien, you want to add something? Yes, uh, the um, a Google additional consent vendor list is a separate signal from the TCF unrelated to TCF, uh, which Google established to um, for some of the vendors that they work with that did not register under TCF. Uh, changes that we make to the TCF have no impact on the uh, Google Additional Consent Vendor List. Uh, so no, there will be no impact on this uh, from the TCF. Google may decide to make changes in the future on this, but that's really up to Google. Uh, maybe for you, Rina, again, a question about uh, uh, the deprecation of the get TC uh, data. Uh, is it technical or for legal policy reasons? So we went shortly over the uh, policy reason of the Belgian DP had raised that uh, vendors were not uh, proactively informed about uh, uh, users uh, with all of consent. Uh, maybe, uh, but maybe you can provide a, a bit more color to, to that, Rowena, and also uh, potentially what it means for GPP as well. Yeah, and so the idea here is that uh, vendors should have the latest and greatest version of the consent strings and um, not while you were you have the ability to actually um, add an event listener as a vendor already um, to get the latest and greatest not um, all vendors were necessarily doing that and so um, that is where this requirement is changing and uh, we're we're saying that you must do that um, and in that case um, the get TC data command, um, you may not, if, if you're just relying on that, it may not be the latest and greatest is what I would say. And, and to maybe, maybe add to this, it is really a legal and policy change that requires us to do that. Because the authorities yeah. have, have stated that the string needs to be the most up-to-date within the session. And if you use get TC data, you get that once and the user can go in and actually change here the, the, the choice they made and then you don't have the updated string. And that's kind of addressing the use case. The event listener will return you, there's a change. And if you implement against the event listener, then a, the implementation will see a change happen and can grab the latest updated string and pass that along, which you're not getting with get TC data. And that's why you know we enforce this now through the APIs. Yes, and just to add on that, because I've seen comment on the GitHub about this, uh, which shows that there was some confusion, but as the add event listener will provide you with the same information that the get TC that I was providing you. So you're not losing anything here. The only thing is that the add event listener on top of what the get TC that I was giving you will also notify you in case of the change by the user. So, but, but it, it should not change much uh, if you were using get tc data you can just really almost in line in place replace the get tc data by add event listener and everything should work as you want plus notification um thank you Julia. we have uh, two uh, questions left uh, so for development purposes, will there be any testing environment provided to test implementation ahead of time uh, so, um, 
I don't know, maybe Ains, we want to talk about the upcoming CMP validator, uh, which may be useful for testing. Yeah, so uh, I'm not quite sure what this is a, a CMP developer, publisher, or vendor asking this question. Uh, in general, we don't have a development uh, uh, or testing environment. We do have uh, for the CM for publishers and the CMPs an updated and refreshed and new CMP validator that's going live uh, on at the latest on May 15th. For you so you can actually check the implementation whether this everything is correct and if you do that if you're a vendor you will need to rely on that there is actually somewhere that it gen a string is generated uh, that has all the values that you need to have we don't provide uh, um, a test environment for that thank you and then maybe uh, uh... Uh, it would be good, Rowena, like uh, there is like uh, always possibility for uh, uh, implementers to ask questions uh, to IAB Tech Lab and also directly into the GitHub repo uh, if they have any issue like uh, uh, with our development, right? Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if you want to. Go I was finding my un the un unmute button, but <laughs> okay. yes, yes, uh, always okay. open to receiving questions, of course. <laughs> um, uh, uh, question: So, can CCF registration be updated anytime uh, prior to June 13, uh, 2023? Uh, so, uh, Julien, do you want to take this one? Um, sure. Uh, so, yes. Um, uh, uh, Soon after May 15, when we will release the final and official specification for TCF 2.2, uh, we will also open registration for vendors to update uh, their registration and indicate the additional information required under version 2.2, uh, data retention, categories of data. So basically, the first Thursday after, uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, right after May 15, vendors will be able to connect to the uh, TCF website and update their registration. They have until June 30 to do that, uh, but the sooner the better. Why we do recommend for CMPs and publishers to wait until July to start collecting and building TCF 2.2 string. Some publishers, some CMPs may decide to start early. Uh, and so the sooner a vendor has updated his registration, the more chances they have to be part of the vendors that CMP that migrate over to TCF 2.2 uh, will collect legal base, disclose them and collect legal base for them under TCF 2.2. If, for example, a vendor decided to wait until, let's say, July 15, the risk for the vendor here is that CMPs will start to collect TCF 2.2 string starting July 1st without that vendor, because it will not be part of the GVL tree that CMP will use to collect 2.2 TC string. So website will start collecting those strings. And when the vendor then on July 15 update his registration is no part of GVL tree, all the TC strings that have been built in between July 1st and July 15, when this vendor was not yet disclosed, will remain without that vendor's any legal base. So that vendor will not be able to perform data processing um, under using the TCF string until the CMP repop the UI and recollect the user choices with his updated TCF 2.2 information. So again, vendors should make sure to, to update before June 30, but if they can do it sooner, that's even better. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I think a, a question for Roina. Uh, know about uh, uh, following the update to the uh, TCF framework for CMP implementation and the repository. So I think this one is a repository for the uh, library uh, and not uh, the technical specification. Yeah, that is a link to the library. I can type a link to the um, PR. 
Yeah, I'm actually not sure that when we answer in writing, it's uh, everyone can see it or not. Uh, because we, I think we put the link, uh, um, but uh, yeah, uh, let us know if uh, if you don't see it. Uh, and uh, and last question, so regarding uh, the get TC data. Uh, so I assume for every new ad call, the publisher at TCF API is updated with the most current uh, TCF string. If the vendor is collecting consent every time before every ad call, is the event listener really making a difference? Uh, especially if the listener informs the vendor of the change of content after the ad uh, has been uh, delivered. Do you want to take this one, Junior? Sure. So, so if you were indeed cutting the get DC data all the time, every time before uh, you were going to process personal data, using the ad event listener would not change much, although it will save you codes. Because uh, you would not have to make a call every time, you just make one initial call to the ad event listener. But the result will be fairly similar. Uh, enforcing the use of ad event listener, which was already recommended in the previous specification, we just ensure and enforce that vendors rely on the latest and greatest TC string. So, uh, and as previously explained, this change is really more legal change than technical change. Uh, but, but that's that's mostly it. Um, if a vendor uh, connect user choices, establish consent through that TC string, perf perform for the perform uh, establish legal base and process personal data, and after the fact, user make changes a choice. This prevents the vendor from further processing personal data. This does not invalidate his previously. Uh, processing of data established on a valid legal base from previous user choices. Thank you, uh, Julien. Uh, and uh, a question for me as well, how frequently will events uh, with consent be fired? So if you register event listener after, after the consent was given, will you be able to get the consent? So this is a uh, functioning of the CMP API. Yeah. Um, Happy to take this one because that's actually exactly what I was referring earlier about some confusion that I saw in comments uh, with regard to the ad event listener versus the get TC data. So uh, again, just for context, the get TC data, you would call this function, it will return you ads instant the TC string uh, and only once. The ad event listener, when you <coughs> call the ad event listener, will same as the get data, we return you ZTC string as it's instant, if available. And if not available, it will then just give it to you whenever the user makes a choice. And if the user later in the page change his choices, you will receive a new event uh, with the updated TC string. So that's what I was saying earlier, that if you are using get TC data, there will be no issue with using the ad event listener. So you don't need to manage cases about this user already made his choice and stuff like this. Like this is all covered within the ad event listener function. So you can literally just replace get TC data by ad event listener, and your code should work just as the same plus further notification. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think to add here just quickly, the, the uh, event listener will return you the event that happens, right? So you know, so if there's right, there if there's consent already given, it will tell you there's already consent there. If the UI was launched, it will tell you the UI was now launched. So you know there's a change potentially coming. And it tells you when the UI is closed that UI is closed, consent has been updated. You get all these events information. And that helps you to stay up to date on the change. Thank you, Anne, and I suggest everyone to have a look at the at the technical spec. Then, uh, so unlike the policy call where we had a um, backlog of like twenty questions unanswered at the end of the hour, I think we are up to date with the Q and A, so we can probably close. And then I will hand over back to you. Then, thanks. Thank you so much, Nina, Rowena, Hines, Peter, and Julianne. That was super helpful. And as mentioned at the beginning, we've taken a list of all of the questions, but actually we went through everything. So that's wonderful. We'll just make sure they're documented in our FAQs. And we hope to see all of you in a couple of weeks' time. So we'll stop motions of the different stakeholder webinars next week. So wishing you all a good afternoon and evening. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>